Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope this morning. We're so glad that you're here. And I mean that with sincerity. We're so glad that each and every one of you is here. We know God has something special for you this morning. Amen. My name is Kate Kalvach. I'm the creative director here. And I wanted to mention, as you walked in, you may have noticed it's a little different in here, right? Uh, if you didn't notice, I'm kind of curious if you've been here before. I mean, it is a little different. <laughs> But um, I wanted to mention that this is very strategic because we've noticed Sunday after Sunday, we've hit this max capacity number to allow for social distancing. And we said, we need to make room for more souls. We need to make room for you to invite your friends. So if you see an empty seat, that empty seat represents a soul. And so we made more chairs, more space to make more room for more souls. And so I challenge you, invite somebody who needs to be in the presence of God. Invite somebody who needs to be encouraged. There's a lot of isolated people out there this, uh, during this season. And to our online audience as well, if you've been on the edge, this might be a great opportunity to come back because we've made some space for you. So yeah, I think that's awesome and we're celebrating this morning. Let's make some room, guys. Well, we're just gonna start this morning off with some high praise to our God. We're not waiting till the second song or the third song. We're gonna lift him up first thing. Psalm 95, six says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And so I implore you and invite you, Oh, come church. Let's come expectant. Let's come ready. He is moving and working. He's in this place. Hallelujah, isn't he good? Let's worship him this morning. Let's give him our all, amen. Take it away, worship team.
feel so good in here already this morning. Man, you guys came ready to do battle and that's awesome. I just, I wanted to say something before this next song. We're gonna sing a song that, man, it's been sung so many, 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 many times, but it has been on my heart in such a powerful way for the past few weeks. And even last night I dreamed about this song. It was so, so weird. And and I'm gonna tell you about it. Um, But I was dreaming about how, and it was so weird because it was like we were getting ready to sing this song and I felt like the Lord wanted me to just stop in this moment and remind everyone in this room about how good our Father is. And one reason I think we need that reminder is, I know for me personally, sometimes it's easy for me to forget how good He is because my life's not always good. I've encountered things, as have you, that they're not fair. Life's ugly. Life's the opposite of good so many times. And I think sometimes we can have trouble separating Him from the bad. But no matter what's happened to you, no matter how grossly unfair or traumatic, our Father is always good. And if you will trust in Him and keep your eyes on Him and remember that, He's the one ordering your steps, not your situation, not that relationship that's driving you insane. He orders our steps. And, and one interpretation of the word order is that he can, he can take things that are chaotic and that don't make sense and he can bring them back into focus and he can give clarity. And even in the midst of all the negative and all the bad, our Father has a way of working all things for our good because he is good. So as we sing this song, and sometimes when songs are so familiar, we can tend to sing them like robotically, but I want your eyes to be open to fresh this morning as we sing about our good father. And if the song's not familiar to you, good news, it won't take you long to catch on because it's a super simple song, but with such a powerful meaning. And I know that we all came this morning ready to worship our good, good father who has good things for us.
darkness, my God, that is who you
be cool if we sing that without music even just have the crowd sing it out because it's so powerful I feel the faith in this room even when we don't see it he's working on your behalf let's just sing that let's stop the music and let's just sing it out Beautiful. God, we feel you in this place. He's our way maker. He's our way maker. Thank you, Lord. Man, he's working. He's moving. He's here in this place. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. You're working miracles even as we speak. Even as we pray right now, he's doing a miracle. He's doing a miracle in your finances, in your family, in your marriage. We claim it in Jesus' name. We claim it in your name, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Um, again, my name's Kate Kalvach. I'm the creative director here. I also serve on the worship team. So. I just feel such a special anointing on this team, and I love you guys and what you're doing. Um, I wanted to share with you this morning, so we may start to sound like a broken record at this point because we've been able to bless Adams Elementary School in our local Oklahoma City community so many times. But again, this is not a repetition, but again, this week, we were able to deliver, well, I don't know if they've been delivered yet, but we're bringing a fully stocked Keurig and K-Cups that they could never imagine to their teacher's lounge and we just love the teachers there. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. You need your coffee. You just need your coffee if you're a teacher, right? And so their teacher's lounge has been kind of sad, you know, and so we've really wanted to give them something that they can use, and so we're just blessing that community, and those teachers know that this church loves them, and we're expanding the kingdom that way. And so you're giving whenever you're showing up to worship. I mean, you know, and you get it, and we're grateful that you see it's beyond just these four walls, but we're impacting this community. And so this is a part of your worship. Thank you for giving. Thank you for being faithful. Um, so if you'd like to give today, uh, we offer it on our app, which is super easy to download. You can get it on the Hope Connection Church app. You can give there. You find all of our events there. You can also give on hccokc.org or text to give. And so again, thank you for being here. Let's turn our attentions to the screens for a few announcements. Good morning. We're glad you're here. We have several exciting things coming up at Hope. We want you to stay in the loop. If you'd like to give today, you can do so during service, online, on the app, or via text. Our number one cultural value as a church is we engage the Holy Spirit. With this in mind, we gather for first Monday prayer and fasting each month from 6 to 7 p.m. God speaks and God listens as we seek Him with all of our hearts. Every second Sunday of the month, we host our Discover Hope class. This class is designed for you to get connected, find your next steps, and learn more about our church. If you're interested in serving and getting involved, this is your next step. Sign up on our app or website. Join us October 30th for Trunk or Treat. Stop at Trunks to collect candy, grab some hot cider and popcorn, and hang out with your Hope fam. Please sign up on our app or website if you'd like to decorate a trunk for Trunk or Treat. We hope to see you there. Thanks for being here today. Remember to follow along with us on social media so you can stay in the loop. Have a great Sunday.
Paulina, it's a crosswalk. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So for those of you that weren't here a couple weeks ago, or maybe you haven't watched the archive online, that is the second of a series of videos that New York City Department of Transportation released. Uh, literally, the theme is don't be a jerk. And the problem is they've had a 300% increase in cyclists in New York City over the last decade. And they found that a lot of cyclists are just jerks. <laughs> They don't care about anybody else on the sidewalk. They don't care about traffic signals. They just do what they do on their bicycle. And so literally the city of New York had to launch an ad campaign to stem the rising tide of jerk cyclists in New York City. Can you believe that? Maybe we should do that in Oklahoma City just with drivers in general. Amen? <laughs> So the whole point of that ad campaign, the whole point of this series has been we have to rediscover grace for one another. The calling card, the hallmark of Christianity is having love one for another. How many knows that the world does not just revolve around me? right? There's other people in the world. There's other people that have feelings and that have uh, issues, and they deserve to receive grace from someone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And so I hope that you've enjoyed this series as we're trying to rediscover grace in pandemic season, in racial tension season, in political season. It's brought out a lot of jerkiness in people, has it not? And so I want the grace of Jesus Christ to be heavy in my life, and I want to express that in all that I do and all that I say. James chapter 2 and verse 8, if you have your phone, pull it out, church app, all the notes, all the scriptures are there. This has been the theme verse for our talk. Your calling is to fulfill the royal law of love as given to us in this scripture. You must love and value your neighbor as you love and value yourself. I know we've read it every week, but I'm going to read it again. You must love and value your neighbor. Your neighbor that stinks your neighbor that smells good, your neighbor that has ornamentation on the lawn, but it's actually just an old rusted out car, right? Your neighbor that's kind of rude to you when you both go to the mailbox at the same time and you wave and they don't. You must love and value your neighbor even as you love and value yourself. Can you say amen? I want to make this statement. It's in your notes. It's your first point. Followers of Christ haven't just surrendered their lives to Jesus, they've surrendered their lives to the gospel. Amen. I expected more response. <laughs> just say amen, even if you don't agree. It makes me feel better up here, okay? Followers of Christ haven't just surrendered their lives to Jesus. They've actually surrendered their lives to the mission of the gospel. And you know what the gospel says? The gospel says, go into all the world and preach the good news. So the mission of the gospel is to go into all the world. That's other people, right? The gospel message is, for God so loved the world. Everybody say, the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. The world is everyone. So I'm committed to Jesus. I'm following Jesus, but I'm also committed to sharing the gospel with the world. And the number one message of the gospel is love. It's grace. It's mercy. I have to give that to others around me. So uh, the last couple of Sundays we've been focused on kindness. Everybody say kindness. Kindness. <laughs> Right, We've been talking about being kind. The next couple of Sundays, what we're going to focus on as it pertains to not being a jerk is patience. Everyone say patience. All right, we're going to focus on how not to lose our patience, not to express a short fuse, but to have patience, not just with our family, but have patience with everyone. And uh, I don't know about you, but I need a baptism of patience in my spirit. 
And I know that's a dangerous thing to pray about. That's a dangerous thing to say. But if we're going to really navigate these tension-filled times with the love of Christ and the grace of Christ, we've got to rediscover what it is to have patience. Now, patience can uh, manifest itself in a number of ways. Certainly, we wait on the Lord for things that we're praying about and that sort of thing. But today, I want to talk about, in the next couple of weeks, I want to talk about having patience when it comes to our anger. Everyone say anger. You know, the opposite of being angry is being patient, right? And I'm going to tie these things together. Anger can manifest itself physically or verbally. This week, we're going to talk about uh, one aspect of it. Next week, we're going to talk about the verbal expression of anger. But uh, when you think about anger being manifest physically, uh, you know, you can throw a remote control at a wall because you're angry, <laughs> I use that example because somebody literally shared with me this past week about um, an intense moment of passion they had with their wife when one of them threw the remote control at the wall, okay? All right, maybe I misled you with how I described that, (laughs) right? So you can manifest your anger physically, and that's bad enough, but when you manifest it verbally, sometimes that's the deepest wounds that we can create. And so either way, we have to get our anger under control. And the truth is, a lot of people that we think they're just, they're just jerks. They're just jerks. They just, we, we think about them, we think they, they just have such a rotten attitude. They're just a jerk. The truth is, probably what they really are is they're just angry. Because when you're really angry on the inside, it manifests itself in a very jerk-like behavior. And that is not the will of God for any of us. Amen? We want to show the love of Jesus Christ. So we've got to find a way to deal with our anger. And uh, let me say this. I've had many people tell me this, and I'm sure you've heard it as well. Uh, You know, I've I've just always had a short fuse. Right? I've just, I've just always had a bad temper. Have you heard anybody say that before? And it's almost like it's this uncontrollable rage, this uncontrollable emotion that there's no way to stem the tide. There's no way to stop it. I'm just, that, that's just who I am. And, and gently and with the grace and mercy of Jesus today, I want to push back against that a little bit. Because I want to say that the Holy Spirit gives us some tools that can actually help us moderate and manage some of that anger that's on the inside of us. And we're going to start today by talking about patience. Um, Patience literally means slow to anger. So you can't really talk about anger without talking about patience. Galatians 5 and verse 22 puts it this way. Uh, It's in your notes. But the Spirit produces the fruit of love, of joy, of peace. Everybody say it with me. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now that word for patience, not that any of you are that interested in the etymology of the word patience, but I'm going to tell you anyway. It comes from the, the Greek word, literally that's macrothumos. And macrothumos, when you break it down, the macro means long, It means slow and long and drawn out. And the thumos means heat or energy or passion or even wrath. And so the word patience in Galatians 5 and 22, that particular Greek tense of patience literally means to have a long fuse on your passion. So it doesn't ignite quickly, but when you have the fruit of patience in your life, you have the ability to not explode in an instant, but you have the ability to manage all of the stuff that's churning on the inside of you. And I think it's interesting that uh, in this list of the fruit of the Spirit, there is also something called self-control. It's in verse 23, self-control. Self-control literally means spirit strength. Now, I don't mean the big S like uh, Holy Spirit. I mean the little S, which is the inner man, our spirit. So to have self-control is to have the inner man filled with strength. So here's what we can say. Real strength is found in restraint. Amen? 
Man, I love having the students on the front row. They're with me. Feels like Wednesday night in here. Real strength is having restraint. You know, anybody can flex. Anybody can, can get uh, big mad, as they say, right, and kind of throw their weight around. You know what I'm saying? Like, just kind of like, hey, I'm the boss. I'm the guy in charge. I'm the dad. I'm the man of the house. Let me show you who's in charge. Don't raise your hand if you know someone like that. Anybody can do that. But the truth is, while we may esteem that to be a sign of strength, it's actually a sign of weakness. Because the louder I scream, the less strength I have in my spirit. The more I have to flex and show everybody who's in charge, and you better answer to me because I'm the boss. The more I walk around with that attitude, the scripture says it's actually a sign of weakness rather than a sign of strength. True spirit strength is someone that has patience. They have a long fuse. They have an understanding that although people in the world are aggravating, raise your hand if you know anybody in the world that's aggravating. All right. Man, some of y'all are living such peaceful lives. I'd raise both hands if my face mic was fixed, but I can't. I'll just do this, okay? We all know somebody that can aggravate us, can push our buttons, but people of patience, people that walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, guess what? They have a long fuse on the inside of them. And I told you from week one, this series is challenging. This series is challenging to me. I know it's challenging to some of you, all of us. It's not easy to keep your spirit man under control. It's not easy to, to be mindful of the fact that everywhere I go, everyone I see in the grocery store, every cubicle I work in on the job, every classroom I walk into as a student, I represent Jesus Christ. I am representing the grace and the mercy and the favor and the love and the gentleness and the kindness of Jesus Christ. I'll take it really home for you. When I walk into my home with my wife and my children, I am representing Jesus Christ with every word, with every action, with everything that I am. Amen. And so I say again, don't be a jerk. <laughs> He's called us to be better than that. We are better than that. You know why we're better than that? Because Christ has made us better than that. We used to be jerks. We used to be murderers and adulterers and liars and drunkards. and We had all kinds of fleshly problems, but Jesus Christ made us better than that. Amen. Amen. You don't have to be a jerk. Because Christ has the power to produce other things inside of you. Spirit-led living is right living. I love the way, can we call it verse 23 one more time? I don't want to skip over this. I love the end of verse 23. It says it in kind of a, in kind of a strange way, but here's what it says in verse 23. He said, there is no law that says these things are wrong. There is no law that says self-control, faithfulness, gentleness, patience, kindness, nothing says that they're wrong. What he's saying in a roundabout way is it's actually right to live with gentleness, with patience, with love, with kindness. And here's the thing. He wrote to a very religious audience. James wrote to the, the tribes that were scattered abroad. He wrote to a Jewish biased audience. And they were trained that everything about God was about a law, was about a rule. It was about what you can't do and what you shouldn't do. And they were actually trained in their minds that the way to know right from wrong is if you could read it in the law. But what Paul is saying is something completely different. If you look uh, at verse 18 of the same passage, when you are guided by the Holy Spirit, you need no longer force yourself to obey Jewish laws. What he's saying is that you don't have to go to a book to see if it's okay to explode and get mad and, and flex yourself and get all kinds of uh, uh, animosity in the atmosphere. So you don't have to do that. If you're living by the Spirit, the Spirit speaks to your spirit and guides you and leads you 
And you don't have to have a law for that. You see, when we're dialed into the Holy Spirit, you know why we have to show up on Sundays and worship? is because sometimes we've been six days out in the carnality of the earth and the world and the people, and there's something about coming into the presence of God. And it recalibrates our mind. It alerts us afresh of, of what this life is really all about. We need to be in the presence of God. Amen? The presence of God moderates our anger. The presence of God moderates uh, when we start to lose uh, control. The Spirit of God actually keeps us in check. Amen. That's why not just on Sundays. It's great on Sunday. But on Monday morning, I have to find a place in the presence of God. I've got to turn on some worship music. I, I know this is like Sunday school teaching to some of you, but let me remind you that the only way you're going to prevent yourself from being a jerk is if you get in the presence of God. The presence of God takes off the edge. Amen. It kind of knocks off some of the edge and some of the anger and some of the aggravation. It makes me gentle. It makes me kind. It gives me a long fuse. Amen. And that's what I need. All right. So we're going to talk about three ways to restrain your anger. Three ways to restrain your anger. It's in your notes. Number one, submit to management. And all of you workers that have managers just almost got up and walked out of this room. <laughs> if you are a manager, you're like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> submit to management. And here's what I mean by that. We have to submit to managing our anger. I, I want to challenge, more than anything else in this message, I want to challenge this statement that I can't control how I feel. My anger is just like this raging fire that cannot be controlled. I want to challenge that today. And I just read to you what the Holy Spirit produces in us. Amen? Come on. The Holy Spirit produces gentleness, kindness, mercy, patience, self-control. But here's what I want to say. This is big. You got to get this if you get nothing else. The only way to manage our anger is to understand that there's some things only the Holy Spirit can do. He puts the seed of patience, the seed of kind. There's some things only he can do, but guess what? There's some things that only I can do. Amen. I think sometimes we have this flowery language in Christianity. Well, if I pray enough and if I do this enough, then, then I'll never get mad. I'll never be angry. I'll never get upset. No, no, no. That's not the way God has ever worked with us. We have the, spray, the, the saying, pray like it's up to God and work like it's up to me. And there is a mingling of works right, and faith. And that combination is powerful. He didn't force us. He didn't make us become followers of him. <laughs> we are not robots that just walk around. Well, I have the Holy Spirit, and so I will never get mad again. I'm just, just going to do my life and depend on the Holy Spirit to do it. That's a partially true statement. But you have to manage your spirit and mingle it with the Holy Spirit. I was talking to someone a, a couple months ago. They planted a pear tree in their yard, and they were describing to me all the difficulties of actually growing a pear tree and all the things that they had to go through. And they said, you know, it's crazy. There's some things that happen with that pear tree that I can't control. But I also know that that pear tree is not going to grow fruit unless I take care of it. Amen? So let's talk about farmers a little bit. I know y'all were hoping when you came to church today we'd talk about farming, right? So let's talk about farming a little bit. Um, there's some things that farmers control and there's some things that they can't control. The things that they can't control is when they walk outside and they look up in the sky and they're like, you know, I really wish it would rain, right? Because the fields are dry and we need some rain. There is nothing they can physically do to make it rain. There's nothing they can do to make the sunshine and the clouds go away. There are some things that only a bigger force can do. 
But then there's other things a farmer has to do. He's got to pull the weeds in the field, right? He's got to cultivate it. He's got to plow it up. He's got to plant the seed. While the seed has a a miraculous life that none of us understand, you can put a seed in the ground and years later it becomes a tree. We don't know how that life is there and how God works that, but we know if we don't put the seed in the ground, it's not just going to sprout up. Man, the guys that are doing our... Uh, our parking lot, one of them is a farmer. Maybe you noticed all the dirt in the parking lot. The progress has begun. Can you say amen? (laughs) All right. I didn't expect the students who have no vehicles to be so excited. (laughs) Right? So they started cutting up the parking lot and the water, and we got dirt all over the parking lot, but it's a sign of progress. I'm excited. But one of them is a farmer, and we were to meet this past Friday, I think it was at 11, and he was a little bit late. And uh, so he showed up, and man, he had bags under his eyes, and he looked like he had been through it. I thought, well, maybe you've been drinking too much, bro. What's going on with you? And then he said, he said, man, he said, Pastor, I'm so sorry I was late. He said, I was on the tractor till 3 a.m. this morning. He said, all week long, we've been sowing wheat. And I was like, this is the city, right? <laughs> And literally around the corner from my house at 44th and Morgan, they have fields that right now, this guy is on the tractor driving around sowing wheat. He said, I hate this time of year. It's so much work. But he said, in the end, it always produces harvest. And he has no idea he's an illustration on Sunday morning. But it's powerful for us to understand that if we are going to produce patience, if we're going to grow the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, yes, there's some things only the Holy Spirit can do in us, in the presence of God. Things happen that no human mechanism can create. But then there's moments on Monday morning in the office when we've got to have a right mind and a right heart and an intentional decision. I'm going to manage my anger today. Sometimes we call it biting our tongue. You ever had to bite your tongue? Yeah. You know what that's called? That's called spirit management. And I think sometimes we're just hoping, praying, Holy Spirit, take the anger out of me. Take the lack of patience out of me. Just take it away, Holy Spirit. I just need you. And we forget that there's some things that we can do to remove, dare I say it, the jerk-like attitude that is right there beneath the surface. I know this, every person in this room, some of you are so sweet. Is, is Claudine here today? Claudine, tech right here, Claudine. She is the sweetest lady. She texted me a beautiful prayer yesterday. I just love, Claudine is just like, I just love this woman. She's so sweet. But do you know even Claudine is capable? I can't even say it. I can't even say it. I can't even say it. Right. So we'll... We'll put Claudine out of the picture. <laughs> and here I am with Deb Gosney. Let's welcome Deb. She hasn't been, wow. Well, I'll put on a mask and socially distance because this is a big move. This is our first time back since quarantine. Welcome back, Deb. So minus Claudine and minus Deb, all of us have this ability, right? Jerk can rise. Anger can rise. There is nothing that ticks me off more than traffic. God called me to Oklahoma City, but sometimes I wonder. Because there are times when I'm trying to come from my house and 44 South is coming. And the merging of traffic. And I'm trying to get this church to do the work of God. And people don't know how to yield. Church. Right? Proverbs 14 and 29. Let's, let's get away from my, my ideas and my attitude. Patient people have great understanding. But people with quick tempers show their foolishness. He says patience is the companion of wisdom, but a short fuse, a quick fuse, it's akin to foolishness. And I just have a question for you. Have you ever known anybody that you would esteem as wise that has a quick, hot temper? Amen. 
we might think, wow, they're a great leader. But we don't necessarily think they're wise. Because a sign of wisdom is the ability to control your spirit. And may, maybe the highest level of wisdom is the ability to control this little S spirit. Amen. It's not that anger is wrong. All of us know, and some of y'all are like, you got all your points to combat me. You're going to send me emails after church. Well, God got angry. Well, Jesus got angry. Be angry and sin not. All true. But the fact that you're about to send me that email tells me that your anger <laughs> oh, this sermon's going off the off the rails quickly. If you don't ever get angry, you're not human, but there is a way to contextualize our anger. And there is such thing as holy indignation. There is such thing as righteous indignation. And, and anger can be used to fuel positive things if we keep it in check. Uncontrolled anger puts you in a dangerous place. My wife said in the pre-service huddle today with all of our Hope teammates, and great job, by the way, babe, on your huddle today, um, she said, listen and silent are created by the same letters. And I thought, wow, that's, I've never thought of that before. Well, I just want to say this. Anger and danger are almost the same letters. <laughs> uh, this is what you call spur of the moment. This Holy Spirit inspired stuff today. <laughs> but the truth is, when you have anger in your heart, you're very close to danger. Amen. So we have to decide to manage it. I, I love this quote. It's anonymous. I don't know who created it, but I read it this week. I couldn't find the author, but here it is. Patience is the ability to keep your shirt on when you're hot under the collar. Isn't that good? Amen. A man without patience is like a car without brakes. You're this close to wreckage. We have to develop the ability to manage our anger. And I threw this in. Uh, you need to decide today that you're going to manage your anger. Because here's the bottom line. This is what I told my, my girls. I have one who's now... 25 or 6, I don't even remember. How old are you, 25? All right, 25. When they get married and move out, you lose track, right? And I have another one. I'm very well aware of how old she is. She's 18. And here's what I've told them both. Before you get in the car with a boy, you already need to know how far you're going to go. Right? When you get in the moment, the heat of passion that's not when you got to make up your mind because we all know, because we've all been teenagers, we all know the bad decision that's about to happen. So decide before you get there what you're going to do. What I'm speaking to you today is before you get in that combustible scenario that you know is going to come with your wife, with your coworker, whatever, you know it's coming. Decide right now if you're going to manage your anger or not. Amen. Because all of us are capable, except for Claudine and Deb. And we need to decide right now, are we going to manage our anger? Are we going to, uh, this is an old statement, master your anger or your anger will master you. Oh, the destruction that has been wreaked in lives and relationships and families and friendships because we couldn't master our anger. Amen. Leads to the second point. Understand the cost of uncontrolled anger. You want to you want to restrain your anger. Let's think about this. Understand the cost of uncontrolled anger. You're less likely to get angry if you realize how much it's going to cost you. Anger usually costs us something. 
I don't remember who I was talking to that threw the remote across the room. That might have been a minor cost, but there was a cost. But there's much bigger costs that come when you ball up the fist and, right? I've never been to a bar, but uh, I really have never been in an actual bar where it was just about the bar room. But I've seen a lot of movies in bars. And it's always the dude with the hot temper, with the chip on his shoulder, that balls up his fist and he throws the first punch. And maybe in 1957, you could do that and walk away and be fine. But in 2020, you're probably going to jail. You're going to have a record. You're going to have fines. There's always a cost to to uncontrolled anger. Now, that's an outlandish example. I don't think anybody in this room is in danger of that. But hear me right now. There are dangers in our families in our, I've known people that have lost jobs because they couldn't control their anger. Amen? I like this quote by, I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> I do know he was a Latin writer of morality. Here's what he said. An angry man is again angry with himself when he returns to reason. Isn't that the way it is? Right? Oh, we're angry at everybody else. And then when it's over, we're angry at ourselves. You never get to the top if you keep blowing your top. (laughs) Is this good teaching today? Come on, you know this. I'm teaching to myself. I'm not putting anybody down in this room. You don't get to the top if you just are constantly blowing your top. Proverbs 29, 22, it's in your notes. A hot-tempered man starts fights and gets into all kinds of trouble. Don't you love Proverbs? It's just so real. The New Living Translation puts it like this. It takes it up a notch. An angry person starts fights. A hot-tempered person commits all kinds of sin. Because when lust is conceived, when anger has conceived, it does tend to lead us into sin. Hot tempers cause arguments. Proverbs 15 and 18. (laughs) Oh, I'm talking to some marriages right now. I love you, babe. I just love you so much. Hot tempers cause arguments. Proverbs 14 and 29. Anger causes mistakes. Now, I know there's a few Michael Jordans in the room that you can channel your anger, and it makes you a better athlete, right? Right? Let anger motivate you. That's a positive example. But most of us, when we get heated up, when we get angry and we start to shake, have you ever gotten so mad that literally you couldn't control? Anybody besides me, I'm just like, I'm I'm shaking. Right? It's amazing the toll that anger can put on you. And it causes you, it leads you into mistakes. You say the wrong thing. Right? You do the wrong thing. It leads you into mistakes. People with hot tempers do foolish things. It's all kind of connected. James C. Heffley, who is a, uh, a scholar and uh, a doctor, and here's what he says. He says, the obvious symptoms of sudden anger are often the red face, the swollen neck veins, the clenched fists, and a stumbling for words. That's why we always leave a confrontation and wish we had said that. But anger, when the adrenaline rush hits, it overwhelms every aspect of your being. The angry person's vision may also be blurred because anger clouds the visual centers of the brain. Dr. Walter Cannon, pioneer researcher in psychosomatic medicine at Harvard University, describes the symptoms of anger more precisely. Think about this. Respiration deepens. The heart beats more rapidly. The arterial pressure rises. The blood is shifted from the stomach and intestines to the heart, the central nervous system, and the muscles. The process of the alimentary canal cease. The processes of the alimentary canal ceases. Sugar is freed from the reserves in the liver. The spleen contracts and discharges its contents of concentrated corpuscles, and adrenaline is secreted in a moment of anger. 
Anger takes over our entire being. It's difficult to control. It's difficult to overcome. It's difficult to stop. But the Spirit produces patience. Amen. Long-suffering, gentleness, self-control. And here's the worst of the worst, Proverbs 11 and 29. I've been a pastor a long time, and I have seen this. The fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worthwhile left. Amen. I know this is not an easy thing to speak today. I'm preaching to myself today. But we have to find a way to manage our anger. We have to bathe it in the power of the Holy Spirit, in submission before God, our creator. And we have to make a decision today that we're going to restrain all of the carnal instincts that have a desire to destroy friendships, to destroy marriages. You know, even as a parent, we can raise our voice and scream at our children and we can cause them to straighten out by fear alone, right? But how many knows in the long term, if that's the pattern of parenting, it produces resentment, it produces bitterness, it produces an anti-authoritarian mindset in that child. Because as soon as they get away from that angry, fear-inducing, hot-tempered parent, they're going to do their own thing. And they're going to carry the burden of that for the rest of their lives. So this is a, something that we have to do. And finally, I'm, I'm running out of time here. If we're going to manage our anger, reflection before reaction. Everybody say that with me. Reflection before reaction. Don't respond impulsively in the moment. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about denial where we stuff it down, right? Where we just, we just push it down and we never acknowledge the anger. That's not what I'm talking about when I say reflection before reaction. Because you know what that does? Just, just hear me right now. When we stuff down, stuff down, stuff down, that produces something called resentment. And the more we stuff down there and don't acknowledge it and don't deal with it, it creates an explosive moment. I've had those moments where I pushed it down for so long that in a moment, it all came to the top. All that resentment, all of that anger, all of that bitterness, it just, it explodes. And so there is an art to managing, to restraining our anger And yes, we have to step back for a moment and we have to collect our thoughts and we have to reflect before we react. But we can't just push it down and refuse to acknowledge it. Now, none of us are going to raise our hands and confess today, but I am talking to people in this room that are living with a simmering flame of anger down on the inside. It could be something someone did to you could be something someone said to you. It could be a parent that mistreated you. It could be the bully at school that pushed you in the locker. But there are people in this room right now that have anger inside of them. And I'm just telling you that today's your day where God is stepping up and he's saying, listen, the Holy Spirit that you have in you wants to produce patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And and I feel like I just I wrestled a lot with this with this talk because I just I, I feel like what I came up against in my time of prayer and as I was seeking the Lord about this message. I feel like what I came up against was two things. Justification for my anger. My anger is justified because of this. And the second thing I came up with was disbelief. 
disbelief that there is no, I've been this way for so long. I cannot change. And so if you're in the justification category, let me express to you, as I have on multiple occasions in this series, that my heart goes out to you. I have compassion, and Jesus has compassion because some of you have every right to be angry, fuming. And Jesus knows that. That's what we talked about a couple Sundays ago. He understands what causes us to be the way we are. And so I'm not condemning you, but I'm telling you that you cannot live on the justification train for your whole life. At some point, you have to realize that I can either let what's happened to me control me. Because, you know, when, when you have anger and bitterness and all that, you realize that the source of that is controlling you. You're not controlling yourself. Unforgiveness the person that you haven't forgiven is still controlling you. Amen. I know that we've been hurt. I know that we've been pained. And and oftentimes our result is when when somebody backs us in a corner, what happens with an animal when he gets backed in the corner? He he growls and he's ready to fight. And that's what we do as humans. When someone hurts us, when somebody is threatening us, when somebody has us dead to rights, what do we do? We lash back. In anger, it's an instinct within us. I'm telling you today that we have to put the justification aside and we have to understand that the Spirit has the power to produce gentleness and kindness and patience within us. I'm talking to people right now that your belief structure has been shaken because of how you've seen things played out in this life. And it has caused you to question who you are and caused you to question what God thinks about you. I'm telling you that God has never viewed you with more love than he does right now. And if we can step away, if we can reflect on the reasons why we're angry, instead of just always reacting to it, the Holy Spirit can move in and do something very deep in your heart today. Amen. Let's stand together. And I'm going to conclude with this. Don't suppress your anger. Confess your anger. Confession is good for the soul. Amen. When we confess, it has a liberating power. And I'm going to say a few things. Number one, you got to confess to yourself that you are angry. You got to admit it. I'm angry. The second thing you have to do is you have to confess it to God. Admit it to God. God, I'm mad. And if you want a template for that, read through the book of Psalms. (laughs) Because David unleashed the furor of his spirit on God and everybody else. He was unfiltered. He was raw. He was angry. He was upset. So admit your anger to God. God can handle your anger. And the third thing, this is the hardest one, we've got to admit our anger to the person, to the source of our anger. It's the recipe that Jesus gave us. He said, if you have, if you're offended by your brother, you got to go to him and you got to talk to him, right? You got to do everything you can to make amends. So we can't suppress it, we got to confess it. And the God of peace and the God of healing and the God of restoration and the God of patience is going to come in and minister in your life. Amen. Can we bow our heads together? Lord, right now, I know there are people in this room that are fighting through frustration. They are fighting through anger. They are fighting through some deep, deep things in their soul. They've been hurt. They've been bruised. They've been wounded. And it's resulted in a simmering flame of rage that expresses itself verbally, expresses itself physically sometimes. Lord, right now, I speak over every person in this room that's dealing with that. And I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come in and you would remind them who they are. They are not child of the children of the devil. They are children of the Lord. And we are works in progress. Lord, you don't expect us to be perfect, but you do expect us to open up 
and submit and surrender to you in these moments. And right now, we open our hearts and we say, God of peace, God of patience, God of love, God of kindness, God of self-control, come in afresh and begin to renovate the areas of my heart that are filled with anger. Lord, you have the ability to help us, to produce in us patience, gentleness, long-suffering, self-control. Do the work, Lord, that only you can do. And Lord, right now, as we all are in this moment together, if there be anyone in this room that they haven't given their life to you, maybe they've never made you Lord and leader of their life, right here, right now, in this moment, I pray that they would have the courage to confess their sin and also to confess that you are the one that saves them from their sin. You are Lord and you are leader of our lives. And today, Lord, we may not know all the ins and outs, but we have made a decision today that we're gonna follow you. Lord, we invite you to come in and do surgery on our hearts and take away the shame and take away the sin and plant in us a whole new nature, a nature that's filled with love, a nature that's filled with the kindness and the patience and the gentleness of the Lord. Move on your people today. And Lord God, we confess openly as a body of believers that we struggle, we struggle to live out the things that you lived out on this earth, but we open our hearts and we say, Lord, come in and do some work in our hearts afresh and anew, and we're gonna manage, we're gonna manage our anger. In Jesus' name, do what only you can do. Amen and amen and amen. Can we lift our hands together, church? We're just gonna sing a quick, quick song through, and we're just gonna rest in his presence and let him do what only he can do today. God bless you.